Hey folks, Matt Lang here. I'm going to be walking you through my remix of Closed Sliding Doors. So when I start any remix, I want to see basically how I can tweak the original parts of it into something new. I don't want to always build everything from scratch. I want to basically be able to take existing parts, like for instance, Sliding Doors has a lot of acoustic guitars. So that's something to me that immediately I'm drawn to, and I want to find a way of how can I take the acoustic guitar, tweak it, but recontextualize it so it doesn't sound like the original, but it still sounds reminiscent of it. So how I started with this was actually once I looked at all the stems, I pretty much decided I'm going to start with the acoustic guitars, and this is what I did with them. So the original guitar stem is this. And that's the main opening hook of the guitar. So I, I really like reverse. I like reversing everything, and I like cutting up audio. So what I basically did, I took those, and I turned it, I basically turned it into this. And it's two tracks, and basically, if we look at what's going on, let's just solo one, take off the effects, or there's really a delay that's giving this a lot of movement. So if you listen to this dry, it's very obviously reversed, and even if you look at the wave itself, you can see it has the reversed, uh, I guess, amplitude of a typical guitar attack. And then I basically took these other ones that I could cut in after, and I believe the delay time is the same. So, yeah, it's a dot or a quarter on this, quarter on that. Okay, so there's the same delay time. But they are down here, so I can basically have moments where I don't have those two notes hitting at the same time. Even though, actually, in retrospect, that was the idea of why I did it like that. And then in actual practice, I didn't do that at all. It's there the entire time. Uh, the only main thing, it is slightly lower in level. There's a... Uh, by 0.7 dB. I mean, it's a negligible difference entirely. But, so I wanted to start with this guitar. And so once I created my basic reverse guitar swell thing, I also wanted to have other bits underneath it that would uh, basically accentuate the new chord progression I'm giving it. So I started with a piano, and I didn't use the piano in the original because I wanted a different chord progression from the original song. So I started with this, and it's just very simple. I mean, there's nothing fancy about this at all. Right? And I printed those, and then I treated these basically the same way I treated the acoustic guitars. And that became this. And here it is without, without the delay. The rest we can keep. There's more going on. The other big thing is, let's mute that. Here's just the reverse piano now that's been cut up. But then I used the Sound Toys Filter Freak, and basically I, uh, I created this little rhythm that uh, it's going to follow that as like a step filter kind of thing. So now I'm sequencing essentially the, uh, the filter cutoff. And then with some delay, and once again, ping pong, this time I'm using eighth notes, Valhalla delay, which is just, it's such a great delay and stupidly cheap, it sounds fantastic. And that's it. So that plus the acoustic guitars, that gives us a nice little ambient bed to kind of start writing around. And you can hear the chord changes a little bit as this is the bar right before we get into the verse, so there's a little bit of a turnaround. But from there, I think uh, that's when I started adding bass as well, and this was actually just bass I played. It sounds like this. And there's a filter being automated. And this is done completely in the box, uh, I mean, aside from the bass, which obviously was out of the box. But I basically, I just tracked the DI, 
And then I put a compressor in front of the DI, uh, just to kind of act as if I was using a pedal compressor in front of an amp. And then for my bass sound itself, I'm using the Dark Glass Ultra Preamp from Neural DSP. And this is a fantastic bass amp. And I've been using it a ton because it just sounds great. It's easy. I don't have to worry about any of you know the miking or the other complicated stuff, which I'm pretty much terrible at myself. So that's why uh, and I don't actually have a proper bass amp in here. But it sounds fantastic. So I'm using the Neural, the uh, Dark Class Ultra, and then that goes into an arouser. And this is my compressor for the bass. It's not, I don't think it's compressing it too heavily. We're averaging about 4 dB of gain reduction. It's not terrible. And then another EQ. And it's just scooping out really the sub and then a little bit of like the low, low mid area. And that's because there's also more bass that's ultimately going to be underneath this. And lastly, the fun thing that I do with this, uh, with the bass sound is basically with the Dark Glass Ultra, it has a blend knob and that can change like you can blend between your cleaner sound and then your overdriven distorted sound. So then I automated the blend. So I go from the clean sound that gets basically automated into the distorted sound. And that happens right before the end of the first verse. And it sounds like this in practice. So here's clean. And then there's a high pass filter that gets automated at the end. Because once again, there's going to be a big drop, so I want to take all of the low end out of it so that when the drop happens, then you get hit with all the low end and the impact is going to be that much more extreme. So also what we have going on in the bass in that section, we have this, uh, this re-space stuff without, the, uh, without anything else. It's this. It's a really nice low rumble. And the rumble itself is really actually coming from a filter. So this is the sound without any of the stuff. And that probably came out of the Moog or, or something. It doesn't really matter. Um, but this is the kind of trick where I take a really raw sound and then I sculpt it into the sound I want it to be. And in this case, I started with a filter. And this filter is the Sound Toys Filter Freak. And I have the frequency set pretty low. I'm using a, a six pole filter. It's a very low cut. And then I'm overdriving the input a little bit also just because I want to saturate basically the sound of the, of the bass getting, you know, really thrown into the filter. So I'll show you without the saturation, then I'll bring it back. Sounds fine. But you get a lot of nice coloration when you do that. I kept it probably around there. And from there, because this is a very stereo sound, which is, you know, a no-no for a lot of people, I'm using the Brainworks Digital V3. I'm using it only for the fact that it has a feature where you can mono a sub or you can mono underneath a certain frequency. So in this case, everything underneath 146 hertz, that's getting summed to mono and everything else stays stereo. So now my ultra wide respace, which is what we call this, it still is like it kicks in the mono in the sub, like we're not going to have any issue, no phase there, but then the sides are also quite wide. And it's a great way to kind of get the best of both worlds. That goes into an EQ. And the EQ is really scooping out a lot of low mids and just the very, very bottom sub. Then I'm saturating it with the black box, which is, you know, such a fantastic saturation plugin. Um, and it just gives it a little bit more grit. Without it. It's subtle, but it just brings out the sides a little bit, just saturates everything quite nicely. I'm a fan. And lastly, then it gets a compressor and that's getting side chained to a kick drum which we will later talk about. But that's pretty much the whole low end for the first half of the song, with the exception of one other bit that ultimately is a, uh, it becomes kind of a signature sound of this remix. And it's called Stray Light, because I made it with Native Instruments Stray Light. And it's a very distorted and ugly industrial sound. It sounds like this. Actually, let's do, do a moment where, let's take off the EQ. Here it is. It's almost like a Godzilla roar kind of thing. You know, it's great sound. And um, I had just gotten this synth, Straylight, so I was very much just learning how to use it at the time. And uh, so I'm just going to pull it up here. And I think... So 
So yeah, that's what it is. So straylight is a granular synth. And so basically it's gonna, you know, it's gonna do time stretching of, you can basically play audio files back, you know, uh, slower or faster without actually affecting the pitch at all, or you could affect the pitch without actually affecting the time. So granular synthesis, ton of fun, very, very powerful. And um, this is just basically scanning through the sound of what I believe is a timpani. I can't really be sure because this is a sample that came directly from uh, Straylight itself. But then the actual uh, programming of it, I did. And the nice thing is you can really, you can stretch things out pretty dramatically. For instance, I just set it to be, it's going to take four bars for you to get through, you know, pretty much the entire playthrough of the file. Um, in the remix, I have it to be about, I think, a bar. But you could also do really fast. But Nice and Slow is a really, it's a fantastic plugin. So that became a, basically a signature sound of the bass, and then that gets layered with the sub. So those two things together, they rumble pretty hard. It's a very aggressive sound, which is kind of juxtaposed against a pop record. So it's, uh, I think there's a nice juxtaposition. That's why I like doing that kind of stuff. But that's basically the bass that we're going to have throughout really the entire track. It's all made out of those elements for the most part, with the exception of basically a mid-bass synth. But we will get to that because I think I want to talk about um, basically the rest of the verse right now and looking at how the instrumental comes together and then look at also the vocals. So this is the basically, this is going to be the instrumental from, uh, from when Chloe herself comes in. And then you get that introduction of this is a transition moment. This is where it's starting to get dark. Hence, we get the evil bass. But um, the only other thing that I haven't talked about so far, aside from the vocals, are the drums, at least in this section. And the drums themselves, they're sparse. They're meant to really not take up too much space. I just want it to provide a groove. And I don't want them to also fight the vocal at all, which is why they're also very dull. There's no high end really at all in these drums. And they're all programmed just directly as audio in the grid. Uh, they sound like this. Very minimal. And eventually we get some high-end movement going, and that comes from uh, these, which are functioning as hi-hats, basically. Um, they're not. It's actually just uh, drumsticks hitting basically the metal part of a... Well, you just heard it. Basically, there's a, a metal bucket down there I bought at Home Depot, and that became percussion. So I just banged on that a bunch of times, and that turned into hi-hats because they sound great. So minus the buckets, which are, you know, that's providing the high end, and they also, it doesn't get automated up towards the end of the verse when I kind of want there to be some, some motion, some, you know, basically raising the energy in that section. Everything else is super filtered, and it's a very, very, very basic beat. So let's look at the vocals. Now, because these were, you know, previously mixed, I mean, even looking at the wave file itself, you know, you can see that these are compressed already. These have already been worked on. Because I'm me, I wanted to do it more. Um, and the first thing I did, and uh, I'm not going to lie, I do feel slightly guilty about it. Uh, the first thing I did was I added a little bit of auto-tune just because, uh, for my taste, the vocals were, are, they were a little bit looser than I wanted them to be, at least pitch-wise. You have to remember, like, the original track, it's quite acoustic. So there, there is more just natural pitch fluctuation in general. If vocals are a little bit, if they, I guess I should say, if they're not perfect, then you're not going to notice it as much. But in this electronic, I mean, this is mostly an electronic track, even though all the sources are, you know, a lot of the sources are largely acoustic. It's still, everything's very quantized. Everything's very tight. So if the vocals are looser than everything else, they're going to poke out a little bit more. 
So I just added a little bit of auto-tune, and I actually just ran it live. Usually if I were you know, really going in, I would do this in graphic mode. But I just ran it live, and you'll see it's doing a little. It's not doing, I mean, my retune speed is 41, it's, so it's not, we're not going T-Pain on this anytime soon. You know, this is pretty, relatively gentle auto-tune. But it does make a difference. There you are. Just on the vibratos. Because you can see, you know, she is jumping, you know, almost 30 hertz in either direction sometimes on her vibrato. So I just wanted to rein it in. So that's what the auto is doing. And then, uh, to me, the vocals were actually quite dark. So, and I like bright vocals. That's just an aesthetic I like. And I love, I really, really love the um, Slate's version of an API 550, the FGA. I'm boosting 9 dB at 10K. And it's giving me all the air I didn't have before. And then as well, I'm taking out a little bit of the low mids. Uh, it's like minus 2 dB at 200 hertz. Let's just go from here, and I'll play you with and without. So, with. Never been able to stop me and my tracks before. Without. You're Ruby. Never been able to stop me and my tracks before. I like the air. That just, it makes them more present to me. I like that. And then there's some EQ, and this is really just, I'm using it purely just to take out the lows, which we don't need at all, because there's so much low end going on in this track with all the different spaces and everything like that. Keep it simple, cut it. And even if you look at the analyzer, you know, there isn't much information really below 200 hertz anyway, so I don't care. Let's get rid of it. Then more compression, because why wouldn't you want to compress things even more? Um, tube Tech CL1B, classic, sounds great on vocals. I'm not pushing it too hard, but you know, it's just tightening it up a little bit more, adds a slight color. Never been able to stop me and my tracks before you. To be fair, it's actually pushing it pretty hard, but I like the sound of that, so that's what I do. And then that goes into multi band compressor and the Fab Filter Pro MB. I'm using this to attenuate the low mids. Um, which is something I pretty much have to do in every vocal, and I like this more than an EQ because a multiband compressor, it's dynamic, and vocals are hugely dynamic. So this is ultimately, this is going to respond to, you know, the, the dynamic changes uh, really in the frequency range of her voice. And the problem frequencies I always find usually are around the low mids. So you're going to see what it's doing. Never been able to stop me and my track. And it's subtle, you know, it's not really pushing more than 3 dB, but it's just enough to clean it all up a little bit. Then, more compression, because who doesn't love more compression? And now I'm using a limiter, I'm using the DMG Audio Track Limit, and it's just, you're gonna see, it's just squashing it more. Never been able to stop me and my tracks before. I'm square waving the hell out of the vocal. I just want it super in your face, really clean. And then I added a de-esser because, well, I added a bunch of high-end earlier. This is going to catch some of the sibilance of that. Never been able to stop me and my tracks before you be So again, it's just clean up. And uh, it's not, you know, it's not working super hard. It looked like maybe it was taking down, you know, 6 dB of the high-end. But only on the really essy parts. And then this is a new one for me. And it's the Soothe plugin, which I know I'm really late to the party on, but it really is fantastic. It really does smooth out vocals in a really pleasing way. But basically, I found this is the problem frequency I found in her voice that was the most sibilant. And it's if you just listen to the band. So it just gets a little peaky. So. Soothe is basically, you know, this is like a super high-tech dynamic EQ. And it's basically just notching out that little area every time it gets a little bit, just a little too pokey. And Soothe is a really incredible tool that you should, I find that if you subtly use it, it's really effective. It's very easy to overdo it and totally kill any character in a sound. And that kind of defeats the purpose. But I also found like just if you just listen to the bands, you get some really, really interesting content also that then you could print and then turn that into other things. Great on percussion, for instance. You get these weird like spectral blips and stuff that you could turn into other things. Really, really cool. After that, there's another limiter. Um, <laughs> I really like limiting, can't you tell? And it's, uh, 
It's just doing slightly more. I and that you tamed now under your control. So the vocals bricked, basically. And uh, the only other thing, then I have some automation. I used a trim plugin to do this. And because of all the compression I've done so far, she really wants to be a part of this. I just want to sit here. Yeah. This is how it's going to be, okay? Right? Okay. Land of cats. Um, because of the amount of compression going on, all the breaths and you know even some of the S's, like everything got brought up really in your face. So I went in and anything that was a little bit pushed forward that was really you know pushed pretty hard, I went in and I automated them down by about nine or ten dB, and that makes everything just sit a little bit nicer. So I still have ultra compression and a really in your face vocal, but I don't have all the noise that's going along with that. And I didn't want to delete the breaths because then it sounds unnatural, but this is a way to smooth out the vocals and still basically have the best of both worlds. There you are. Versus. There you are. So it makes a big difference and it's tedious. And I just went and I did it on pretty much any vocal that I did this extreme amount of compression to which in retrospect, I'm looking at it now, and I'm, I mean, it's a lot. It actually kind of frightens me how much there is, but it's what I did. I don't think you should ever uh, criticize yourself for being creative in a moment, and it sounds good. So if it sounds good, it is good. But all of this leads into basically like this, uh, this section right before the drop, so to speak, and that's when everything darkens up, and let's take a listen to that. So, like I was talking about earlier with using the uh, automating the gain on the neural dark glass preamp, that is where you start to hear, you know, it builds and it creates this really, uh, it's an aggressive moment where it sounds like something intense is going to happen and lo and behold something does. Her vocals also, they get more energetic in this section. So I really want to create something that juxtaposes against the vocals and also emphasize the fact that this is more aggressive right here. So now the chord progression just becomes a pedal tone. Um, I think it's an E, and we're just pedaling on the E the whole time, and that builds up into ultimately what's the drop. The vocals, aside from a little edit right there, they're in your face. Been my soul, you move me, you move me, then you leave. And that little edit, that's just done in the audio, uh, and there's some panning automation. So. I just took, basically, you can see that uh, it's that part of the wave right there. So I took this guy, this little region, and regions don't have genders, so let's just call it uh, region. E took that, e cut it really close, down to a 30 second note, e and started copy pasting them, and that's how I created essentially the kind of effect, right? So I did that just a little bit more in depth with a couple other like little bits of the vocal. And then the panning, it basically throws it really quickly around your head. And they're clicks, and I left the clicks in on purpose because it makes it sound more robotic and more mechanical. So that's how that little effect is created. And that brings us to our big drop of bass. So let's talk about what's going on here. And this is entirely instrumental. Now the drums are a lot bigger. Much, much. I mean, before they were filtered, they were, you know, really ducked behind the vocal. Not so much anymore. So we have two kicks. This is my synthetic kick. Came out of a modular synth. And um, basically, just 
what's going on. There's a little bit of EQ on it, and a lot of it's coming. There's a lot of character coming from trash. So here's without it. The EQ dips a little bit of mids, or I guess lows. Yeah, 85 hertz, whatever. And trash, this is doing a lot because I have it set to be multiband. And basically every band, and I set the crossover for whatever reason to be 691. And basically every band is getting affected and distorted in a different way. So without it, with, makes it a lot bigger. So that's the, basically, that's the synth kick. So then the other kick I have layered with the synthetic kick, this is the live kick that came from the original recording session of Sliding Doors. And without any of my stuff to it, it sounds like this. I mean, it is going through my kick bus, but aside from that, um, nothing. And the first thing I did was I actually did this with a multiband compressor instead of an EQ, and it's basically taking out the low end. The reason why I did it with this is I wanted there to actually be a slight amount of low-end attack. So I want it to catch it really quickly, but I don't want it to just be super weak sounding. So remember, the other, the other kick drum is going to give us all the low-end, but I still want a little bit of punch from this. And if I slowed the attack, it's quicker, or I made it faster, I should say. Then you lose a little bit of it, slow it down. Then you get more of it. I found right over here, this is where I get still a little bit of snap but then it ducks the low end pretty quickly. Right about there. And then that goes into a compressor, and this is, you know, this is hitting it just to really squash it a bit more. Gives it a little bit more attack, and then it goes into an EQ where I'm just taking out further low end. But that layer, which really makes the first multiband compressor really quite redundant, but again, creative process, I'm just going, I'm like, yeah, let's do it. That makes sense in the moment, and in retrospect, when I go and look back, it's kind of like, well, what was I thinking there? But this is just part of the process. <laughs> but layered with the, uh, the synthetic kick, now it sounds like this. So pretty decent sounding kick drum. Both of those, they get layered with an 808 style kick, and I made this just using uh, FM8. And then we get basically some nice big claps and a snap and a snare and all, you know, just big wide stuff. And first thing in here, we have a clap. It sounds like this. And it's already, you know, you can hear it's like it's cut, it's distorted. You can look at it, you can see it's pretty, uh, it's pretty squashed already. Not enough. I added. Uh, <laughs> 12 decibels of drive with the newfangled audio saturate, and now it really blows it out. I think it came from the modular or something like that. But uh, actually, no, I made it with FM8 also. That's right. And then layered together, Sounds nice. And the great thing about having a stereo clap and a basically mono snare is you get all the punch in the center of the snare, but then you get the stereo width of the clap. So that's something I find very effective. And then when you have it layered, you know, with your low end, everything sits really nicely together. So then now the buckets, they have their full high end. And we also add this other bit of percussion. And it's called Morpher Perk because I made it uh, basically using a plugin called Morph. And it does basically a spectral morphing between two sources. And I know the first source absolutely were the drums uh, from the original. What I morphed them with, I've actually been trying to find it. And the only thing I can guess is that it was probably like a drone or some kind of sound from the modular synth. But, so I, I actually frankly have no idea where it came from. But I know it came from this, at the very least. That's, what the, that's how the percussion started. 
And how it ended was this morph percussion. And clearly there's some, you know, there's a delay in there. There's, there's a lot going on. But it kind of gives us this kind of like cavernous, dark, very cinematic kind of feel. And uh, layered with everything, it just gives this really nice depth. And that's really the purpose of it is depth. And lastly, on the downbeats, we get this very like industrial just and it's the buckets just heavily distorted. Very, very, very distorted. So the whole drum section, basically, all of this now, let's just take from over here. Ah, and there's shakers too. And this is a fun, this is actually one of my favorite tricks with shakers. I did it with both, so it doesn't really matter. Let's just do, uh, just do it with this one for now. But that's how it sounds, but without the processing. It's a very different sounding shaker. And that's because bit crushing a shaker is probably one of my favorite things you can do because suddenly you get all this high end, it gets nice and crackly. And it's going to, you know, especially if it's a stereo shaker, and mine always are, it's going to basically accentuate the stereo width of everything. So that's the bit crush shaker now. And then I just go to town with the EQ. And I mean, look at that. I mean, I, I cut out everything below 1K and uh, probably a little bit higher than that. And, or yeah, 1600 actually. Boosted the high end and that turned that shaker into this. So now it's this really wide and just very crunchy shaker. I did the same thing with the one above. Most likely, just looking at it, I believe what you just played, or what I just played, is actually a pitch shifted version of the other, and then layered together. Nice and big and wide, and they're not fighting anything either, because nothing else is in this frequency range. It's all just like super high end, and it's crunchy high end. And this is when the bass kicks in. And so here is our bass. And this is our main bass, and then I'll include Stray Light, why not? And you can hear it's kind of ducking a bit, right? And it's just doing volume automation. This isn't using a, uh, a plugin or anything like that. This is purely using volume automation to duck the bass whenever the kick hits. I think I might be hitting, and also whenever the snare hits as well. So. We put these together with the bass. Let's straight light out for the moment. Super clean sub, super clean. And stray light's doing that also. Uh, there's a clearly there's an effect on stray light, and it's just it's a tremolator. That's what's making it do the uh, robotic thing. But with tremolator. And it's just a shape I made, but I mean, it's basically like a kind of like rounded off square. So it's not clicky, but it still has that kind of uh, like pulse square-esque uh, tremolo to it. So that's what's going on with that. And finally, we're introduced to basically the bass that's going to become a theme. And that's essentially this. And that gets introduced in this main groove section. And this was made in the box. Uh, I made it with Serum, actually. And uh, this is actually the channel right here. I, I brought it up so we could actually see what it was. But um, first of all, let's take, there's a delay on it. Let's take the delay off. And if we look at the plugin itself, it's stupid simple. It's two, it's two saw oscillators. Like, there's nothing else. Um, there is a filter, but basically what's happening here is the, um, I programmed a, an LFO, and it's basically a square LFO, so every, uh, I think it's every quarter note, every eighth note, um, every quarter note, okay, right, so yeah, LFO too, so every, well, I guess, no, it is every eighth, but every eighth note, it's getting panned hard left and right, and it's a, every quarter note, you get the square shape, but you get both sides of the square, so, or both of the polarity. So anyway, what that's doing is every time you get a note, it's going to pan around your head. 
But then that goes into a delay. Delay is a dotted eighth, and um, it is, uh, it's just a straight, like pretty much clean digital delay. But that gives it now this kind of, uh, it's already a stereo bass, but now it's gonna be more stereo. Very cool effect. And then I just added a lot of high end as well as cleaning up the low end. And when you layer it with the drones, Nothing's fighting each other, but they're all complementing each other, and it's all very deep. I mean, there's a lot of sub and a lot of bass in general. And this is also when her vocals come back in, and we get her chorus vocals. And they sound like this. Then we're back to the start, now the split apart, the roads are shifting, our worlds apart, and we've been here before, through these lighting hours. So, there are three layers. Um, basically, there's the lead, and there are two tracks for the lead because they were punched in, and it's pretty much the same vocal chain as before. But we also now have the doubles, and we have some harmonies layered underneath that. And interestingly enough, so when I got the stems, for instance, the doubles and the harmonies, they both have, they're already, they're printed together, there's reverb printed on the track. Then we're back to the start, now the spinning apart. Of so, I mean, I added a little bit of extra reverb because they're going to my chorus bus, and that has all sorts of sense. But um, there's not a whole lot I could do because they were already printed together. So literally the only thing right now is, and remember, these are also, you know, pre-mixed vocals, theoretically. I'm just cutting out more low end. And same thing with the harmonies. Back to the start, another split in our heart in the road. Same thing. Now I'm just stepping out a little bit more in the low mids, but for the most part, I'm really not doing much. But all of these vocals, they are all getting sent to my chorus vocal bus. And my chorus vocal bus has, again, just a low cut, but it's compressing them all together. Actually, let's mute the, uh, let's mute the sends as well. Then we're back to the start, now they're spinning apart, the roads are shifting. And actually, there's no compression happening. I thought there'd be more, um, but no, none at all. It goes to my regular vocal reverb, and my vocal verb, it's just the, the UAD Lexicon 224. I love it for vocals. And that goes to an EQ after the reverb just to clean up the low end of the reverb. And then that also goes to a delay. The delay is just good old Echo Boy chord note. And it just gives us a little bit more space. So really simple. And that's pretty much it for this section. There are little moments of where I've cut other bits of the vocal. And, there you are. and then I've EQ'd it really hard just to kind of uh, give it that kind of like telephone effect. So you can see it's just a really hard bandpass filter. And that happens right, basically, in a transition section. And then it goes back to a drop section, and now we have some really big snares, just with a ton of reverb, and it's all just to make everything basically sound more epic. When we get to the second verse, now I'm going to keep carrying that bass that I introduced, the kind of like the panning, hocketing one. That's going to get carried into the second verse. So now when she starts singing again. How could we be so blind? Thinking you're just black and white. We walk into the fire just to feel alive. We love the way it burns. But we and this is just the way of basically like keeping the intensity that I've been building going. So I wanted to carry that verse bass, or, or that bass that I introduced basically uh, in that like heavier groove section. I want to keep that going down the second verse because I want this track to basically keep building momentum the entire time. And the way I'm doing that is by actually using that bass and also changing the chord progression now. It'd be, it's a much darker chord progression. It's just basically going between an E and an F, which is, you know, the F is the flat too if we're in E minor, which is like the Metallica note. You know, it's the evil note. It's a great note. And so consequently, that's what I'm using to kind of keep this section really dark, even though it's a verse section. And then halfway through, 
Then I go back to the original verse chord progression I had before just to lighten up a bit, but I really wanted that original like hit the second verse because it's coming out of this heavier groove section to carry that darkness with it. So that's how I did that, and that's also why I did that. But if we go into the section where you see the transition, now we're going to also, you know, it's going to basically like recapitulate the theme that was introduced in the first in the first verse. So even though I still, you know, I changed the chord progression, I'm keeping that, you know, that very like aggressive synth going at the same time. And it's just, it's basically tying all these different ideas together in a way. So it is cohesive. There's a lot going on. I mean, it's, there are a lot of channels in here. It's a, it's very, it's a complex mix, but just compositionally, I wanted to find ways to also have all these different elements that will come together and they all make sense. And the whole thing sounds cohesive in general. So now we're getting into a new chorus again. And this is our second chorus. So again, same idea. I want to keep the momentum going that I've been building, but I'm going to take all the drums out because I want there to be a bit of a space. I want there to be like basically space to breathe. And then the drums are going to come back in basically halfway through the chorus. <laughs> So halfway through that chorus, you start hearing something else on the high end. And that's actually more guitars. And these were cut out of the, uh, the original acoustic guitars. And I just cut these up out of the original guitar track and just added some delay, layered them in, and just basically that's about it. There's some EQ taking at low end, but it sounds like this. And it just pedals that pattern the entire time but that layered with everything, it just gives it more momentum. And that's the only thing that we really hear that's getting added at this point. And that brings us into the bridge. So there are two things that happen first. First is we have this like uh, time stretched vocal kind of thing going on, this. Right? And that's putting Chloe herself directly in the stray light. And let's see if this works. So that's the basic idea. But um, I just sequenced it, so this is actually the, uh, the notes themselves. And that's how I created that sound that is then kind of used basically throughout the bridge really to kind of create this ambient layer, but it's an ambient layer made out of her herself, which is great. So then the other thing that you hear is when the vocals come in the bridge, they're very filtered down. And I, everything kind of filters down because I want this moment to get quieter. It's kind of a, a psychoacoustic trick where you make everything smaller, so that way when you introduce it in like its main like final form, it sounds that much bigger again. So the vocals themselves, there is just a uh, it's just a filter on them in general. I think you can see it right here. It's just the uh, McDSP filter or filter bank, and it just brings everything super down. Wow. But our feet are getting tired, tired. And that they open up towards the end, and then we get another granular vocal effect. Yeah, but we always fall down, down, down. And 
that just gives us like, it, it's a cool moment of excitement. It's, it's weird. And that vocal effect was made with Reactor and it's very difficult to replicate it. So I'm not going to do it on the fly, but it's granular synthesis using uh, Reactor, which you should get into Reactor if you want to do fun stuff. So this is my little Reactor Ensemble I built to uh, basically do this vocal effect. And basically it's just, it's a granular ensemble where basically I can, uh, I can hold a key, it's gonna freeze her, and then I can basically move her around anywhere I want in the waveform. I can also change various things like, uh, like the distance between the grains. The length of each grain. So basically all I did, I just automated the distance between grains. And it sounds, you can actually just see, like visually, that's the automation. And that's how I made that vocal effect, really easy. And there is some, uh, I guess, panning automation to kind of, you know, really make it a little bit wackier. And then on top of it, there's some audio editing to, you know, get the really buzzy, buzzy sound. But that's the basic idea of how that that kind of sound effect is made. And that goes into our final chorus, which is supposed to be, you know, the biggest moment of the entire track. So what makes this the biggest version of the chorus is that basically we have every element that I've introduced in one way or another basically all hitting now at the same time. And it's it's all working together. But for instance, like the vocal pad that we had earlier that we introduced, this thing. That's now layered with all the vocals. All those extra high-end guitars. And the 808s, these are actually following, you know, the bass motion too. So it's just really very huge at this point. And uh, it's, it's supposed to be, you know, this is the climax of the song, theoretically. So then to end the track, I just kind of let the ideas ride out. Um, some of the elements fade out, but it's, you know, it's supposed to be a pretty simple but elegant ending to a track that became pretty intense. So I'm just kind of basically removing elements slowly and that lets it peter out. And that's how it ends, just with another like little glitch edit on the vocal. And that's basically the entire way I, uh, I put this track together. Uh, as you can tell, it's uh, looking back on it, you know, there, it, it's interesting. When you're, you know, when you're in the creative zone, you make these choices on the fly that don't actually make a lot of logical sense later when you look back. But it's just part of, you know, you just get in this inspiration hole where you just kind of like mix, you know, split decisions on the fly. And things uh, aren't always as clean cut as they theoretically should be. And then you look back later and you really are like scratch your hand like, wow, oh, that's an interesting choice. But um, it's just, you know, that's the nature of the beast, especially when you're being creative. And this is doing a remix is far from just pure technical work. I mean, this is, you're creating a new track. And that's what I like about remixes. You take an, you take an idea, but then you have to figure out, again, how am I going to turn this into something new where I'm still, you know, paying homage to the original track. I don't want to, you know, discredit the track. but how am I going to turn this into something that's more like me? And 
it becomes a puzzle of how can I take these original parts and you know, really not just use the vocal first, but you know, it's like edit the guitars and things like that, like create things out of the original that, uh, that becomes unique. And that's always my favorite part of doing a remix is that kind of creative puzzle of like figuring it out. It's just like, how am I going to do this? So that's how I put together my remix of Closed Sliding Doors. As you can tell, there is a lot of weird stuff going on, and even I'm looking back at it now, and you know, I, I thought I knew how I did this, and I rediscover things pretty much you know, on almost every section that is like, oh, that's interesting. That's not at all what I thought I did. But again, that's part of the process. You know, when you're doing a remix, it's no longer just a technical thing. You're not mixing a track. You, know, you're, you are mixing it ultimately, but you know, you're, really, you're writing a new track, and you're creating something that you have to, you know, you do have to pay homage to the original. I mean, you don't want to make a remix that sounds nothing like the original because then who would ever, like, who would know it's actually a remix? So it needs to pay homage to the original, but you also want to make it yours. And so this is how I did that with closed sliding doors, and hopefully you got something out of it. And uh, take care.